realized that I had been uh, placed in the article under the pseudonym of Randall, and I couldn't help but notice that almost everything that the article said about me was incorrect, which kind of put a lot of the facts in the article in question for me. Let the discourse begin. First, he is co-host of The McGraw Show, weekday mornings from 6 to 10 a.m. Central Time, consistently named as one of the top radio talkers in the market and nationally. Welcome McGraw Millhaven back to the arena from KTRS. And we're also joined by the man who fears no issue and certainly no one when it comes to money and the international entanglements it can cause, veteran economist and professor of business at the University of Maryland, Peter Morisi. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for joining us today. Welcome in. Thank you. Nice to be with you. All right, Peter, let's get to you first here. We're going to start out with Rolling Stone here. This was an absolute disgrace what they did here. They got it all wrong. They checked, and now the Columbia School of Journalism comes in, the graduate school comes in, and rips into them for everything they did wrong. They retract a the story. Apology's not going to do it. Now the school is going to file legal action. Doesn't this just well, tell I'm us, though, where some people go when it comes to journalism? It doesn't exist anymore. It not only tells us something about journalism, but it tells us something about the leadership of the University of Virginia. Let's consider what happened. Uh, immediately, the female president of the University of Virginia, upon seeing the article, suspended Greek activities and the fraternity from the campus. Yet, a simple investigation would have revealed almost immediately that the article had to be false. The police found not only did these events not take place, not only was there not a gang rape, but there was no party that night at the, at the fraternity house. These guys weren't even there. A simple investigation would have revealed that. But what it displays is the bias in journalism and among those who run American universities against males. Isn't it also Simply, part of the bias here? female pointed a finger, and so it was assumed to be true. And why not? Why are we not vilifying today the president of the University of Virginia? She's getting a pass from the feminists at the Columbia University School of Journalism, from Rolling Stone, and I don't see anybody calling to question her actions. All she had to do was say, was there a party that night? McGraw, I have to tell you, Peter brings up a great point here because this was a knee-jerk reaction. It's a knee-jerk. As a matter of fact, even the writer of the article admits that apparently she was buying into the story because she might have had a predilection simply to go for the story, to go where it was going and not use everything she could to find out everything that went on. I think Peter's got a good point about the university. I think Peter has a great point, but, but while, while he does have a great point, but let's not Let's not say that all of journalism is terrible. Let's not say all of all presidents are terrible. This was an isolated incident. There's some great journalism out there, and there's some really bad journalism out there. This happens to be really, really bad journalism, and he's right. All they had to do was check to see if there was a party that night, and there wasn't. A lot of people messed up on all of this, but it goes to a larger issue. It's, it's almost like the situation where, oh my goodness, I was robbed, Oh, no, no, I wasn't. But it's you're so used to and there's so much discrimination, so much sexual misconduct on college campuses, though, that even though that gang rape didn't happen, that doesn't negate the fact that there are serious issues on college campuses and all around America of women who are being abused by men and who are afraid to come forward. Peter, you've got to agree with that as well, because I have said this many times on this show, because of the binge drinking, the parties, the frats, the sororities, all the issues there, the schools themselves do not hammer down on this. They don't lock it down. They just let it go, because why? A lot of people will come back later as our alum, and they will give us a lot of money. Well, I don't know if that's, they'll give us a lot of money, but there's a basic problem of promiscuity on American campuses and an unwillingness. I mean, look what happened at the University of Kentucky uh, after the loss to Wisconsin. Immediately, there was vandalism and problems. My university has been particularly noted for having those kinds of problems. Uh, but there is a pervasive notion that the problem... Uh, it, with American men at, at American universities is something that, while they're almost a lower form of life, there is endemic discrimination against males on American college campuses. Let me use the EEOC kind of criteria. If I was running an organization in which 40% of the men, excuse me, 40% of the women, but 60% of the men succeeded, uh, would you say there was, you know, bias? Well, that's the situation we have in American universities. Only 40% of the diplomas are given out to men. The environment has become hostile to men. Uh, in an effort to deal with, you know, sexual harassment, they've gone way overboard. I recently got a memo. Uh, I've been teaching school since 19... 19... 15 seconds, Peter. 
that I would be required to take sexual harassment training. You know, some, some, some 40 years after I entered the profession, more, 44. It's absolutely absurd. All right, I tell you what, McGraw, I'm going to let you counter on this one, but I want you to bring in your side here right after we take a break because I don't want to cut you off because I know that there's a lot of things here that we need to discuss. We will discuss this. We will dig a little bit more into this. Also, we have to talk about Rand Paul, who's going to announce for president tomorrow, and is he really electable? The arena continues right here on Midpoint. All right, welcome back, co-host of the McGraw Show, weekday morning, 6 to 10 a.m. Central Time, KTRS in St. Louis, Missouri, McGraw-Millhaven, and veteran economist, national columnist, professor of business at the University of Maryland, Peter Morisi. All right, I'm, I'm going to get to you on this one here, McGraw, because I want you not only to discuss what Peter had said with regarding men being under attack at college campuses, but also I want to show the apology that came from Rolling Stone here. People get a chance to read it as we talk. This was a, a wonderful apology, but in many ways, it really didn't cover everything, and it might have set the whole cause back of going after on-campus rape and believing people decades after people now have to realize and think, gee, I wonder if somebody's really telling the truth. Do you want me to, do you, No, please uh, do. No, that's it. Oh, please, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think Rolling Stone is, is not forthrightly coming forward yet. I know the writer was a sort of a, a, a part-timer and a, and a, but something more should happen to her. She, she should be vilified more. Should Rolling she be Stone, fired? Absolutely. But she, she's a stringer. So I don't know how much, how much more you, you can actually fire someone who's, who's a stringer, but she should never write again for that magazine. Editors should roll. The, the editor on top should go. This is, this is as egregious as it gets. And as the report said, this is journalism 101. There's, it is disgraceful that a national magazine like the Rolling Stone did something like this. And to the larger point, the university president is right. This has done more damage to women coming forward. And I, in, out of all of this, I heard one woman say that she has a rule. And her rule is she never goes to the second floor of a fraternity, which I thought to myself, wow, that's a very good rule. It's a safe rule. It's very sad rule. But in all of this, we're, 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 we're objectifying men and we're ruining the male species. The women are being preyed upon on college campuses. And the mere fact that they won't go to the second floor, that's a good, safe strategy. I would say to the professor, if you had a daughter, isn't that a good rule of thumb for your daughter to use when she goes to a fraternity party? Peter, I didn't get this to you. Should the writer have been fired immediately? I absolutely. And the editors need to go. But also the president of the University of Virginia needs to go. It is a sad commentary that fraternities are what they are. I, I, you won't get an argument from me on that. But it's one thing to tell your daughter that she shouldn't go to the second floor of good advice of a fraternity house during a party or any other time. It's another thing to tell a man that he has to watch everything he utters every place he goes on an American university campus. You know, if the situation had been reversed and it would have been women that were accused, I think that president would have investigated, male or female, and would have taken it upon him or herself to protect those girls until the facts were, were borne out. Instead, this president attacked those men, damaged their futures. You know, these students are entrusted to us. I know under the law these days, 18 is an adult, but let's face it, adolescent, adolescence in men goes well beyond 18. And to some extent, I view myself as a custodian of these people. I, I view myself in local parentis. And they just did not live up to that standard. Unfortunately, we have university presidents today that are kind of like big city politicians. They're good at saying the right things, and they, 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 they go with the wind. They really do. Political correctness has gone beyond what is reasonable. It's just like what happened in Indiana and the, that poor owner of a pizzeria. That poor fool didn't know what he was getting himself into. But he got vilified and so forth. This whole situation is terrible. But, I mean, the whole notion that every male must be hauled off to political indoctrination by their university presidents to suit the purposes of the Department of Education and the prevailing wind, 
you know, we had we had similar episodes like this in the past: McCarthyism, the Spanish Inquisition, and so forth. The well, I would hope it's not the Spanish Inquisition because I'm not looking for any weapons to be for brought men in. Right now. I'm hoping it's not the Spanish Inquisition. I'm hoping we don't have to bring weapons into this. But I think the point <laughs> you make is actually pretty good. I got about a minute left. We we still have other things to discuss. But McGraw, I'm going to let you get the last word then on this. Uh, Teresa Sullivan is the president of the University of Virginia. Uh, she has bashed Rolling Stone away on this, uh, but I do think Peter brings up a good point. Every man now has to be very careful what he says at any time, especially around UVA. You can only imagine what the climate is like at this point, thanks well, to the magazine. It's, it's one thing to say something sexually suggestive or whatever else. It's another thing not to have women go to the second floor. They're not going on the second floor because they don't want to hear dirty jokes. They don't go to the second floor because they don't want to be abused or sexually harassed and or, God forbid, raped. So saying something is very different than actually physically doing something. I will agree. And hopefully if, there is a, if there's a modicum of safety there that everybody is thinking of and that everybody is taking a step back. But I'll also go on record as saying that what the university presidents allow some of these frats and these sororities to get away with is sure. absolutely mind-boggling. And they've been doing it for decades. And the universities do absolutely nothing until something happens and then they react when they know the whole time there are blackout drunk parties going on at these fraternities and sororities on a nightly basis. There, there's my 10 cents. Gentlemen, if you would hang on, we got a whole lot more to do. We still have to get to Rand Paul. We want to talk a little bit about Iran, uh, maybe even the pizza store. And oh yeah, by the way, we have two things that are really of big import. We have the final four and the final game tonight and the beginning of the baseball season and the Cubs have already lost. There you go. More to come on the arena right here. Here we go. A lot to get to. Co-host of the McGraw Show, weekday morning, 6 to 10 a.m. Central, KTRS St. Louis, Missouri, McGraw Millhaven, and national columnist, professor of business at the University of Maryland, Peter Morisi. All right, gentlemen, we got a lot to get to, so let's get right to it. Peter, to you first. Is Rand Paul actually electable under any circumstance? Well, if Barack Obama could be electable from the radical left, then Rand Paul, the Tea Party guy, is electable. Will he be elected? I don't think so. I don't think he can beat Hillary Clinton. What's more, I find his policies and inclinations very dangerous. His notions about the Federal Reserve as an economist to me are frightening. And his notions about foreign policy, to think that we could have an isolationist foreign policy, I mean, that may be the only thing worse than what Barack Obama is doing. I'm not too sure if the people actually in St. Louis, Missouri would go for Rand Paul under any circumstance. McGraw, what do you think? Actually, there is a large contingent of uh, young college kids who are big uh, Rand Paul supporters, and they came out in droves uh, four years ago. I, have, I, I think he'll have a problem within the other uh, party when he talks about being a libertarian. A libertarian means hands off, means you know, uh, free will, do what you want. I'm not so sure the party is going to accept legalizing marijuana, legalizing heroin, le legalizing cocaine, gay marriage being all right. So I I'm not so sure he can even win the the party's nomination, no less winning the general election. Peter, come we'll back to you. Oh, go South ahead. South Carolina. No, go ahead, Peter. Go ahead. I, I covered you up. He will have a lot of trouble in places like South Carolina. A tremendous amount of trouble, and I agree with that. Peter, to you, because this comes to an article you wrote talking about economics making the Iranian nuclear deal unenforceable, and that's the first words out of your printed mouth here. The nuclear deal with Iran will prove unenforceable. Why? And bring that economy into it, please. Well, folks don't realize this, but Iran has the potential to be the Middle East Germany. It has the oil resources of Saudi Arabia, the natural gas resources of Russia, the mineral resources of Australia. It's got a well-educated population, a substantial middle class, a well-developed stock market. Once the sanctions come down, there's going to be a, a rush of Western investment into Iran reminiscent of the California gold rush. It's simply going to be profound. Ten years from now, Iran is going to be such a powerhouse that it won't be challengeable from a military perspective. Israel's going to have a lot of trouble maintaining qualitative superiority. And frankly, if they want a bomb, they'll be able to get one. Uh, I don't believe also the United States will be able to impose sanctions five to ten years from now the way they do now because we won't continue to have the grip on the global financial system and the ability of, say, an oil power like Iran to get paid that it has now. My feeling is this is a flawed deal in many dimensions. McGraw, the people in St. Louis, do they care about all this? Are they saying anything about it? Uh, there, are, there is some talk about it, and I'm certainly no expert, but if you talk about all that Western uh, money coming into Iran, wouldn't then Iran not want to bomb something that would then be hurtful to their economy? Yes, they have a middle class. Yes, they have a sort of a Western-educated 
uh, philosophy there. If you bring them into the world community, would they then not want to bomb us and or bomb our friends? Germany, I don't think we're talking about Germany wanting world domination like we did in World War II because they're brought into the global economy. Back to you, Peter. Let me, let me respond. I mean, did we suspect that India and Pakistan would want the bomb? You've got regional rivalries that will cause people to want to have access to that device. And the, the real problem here is because Iran could get it, and I think it could get it very quickly under this agreement within a year, not enough time to respond and to, to put together sanctions again. Israel's going to want to get a hold of it. Saudi Arabia could buy the technology from Pakistan. Uh, this doesn't solve the problem. The deal doesn't go far enough. One of the problems we had is that Mr. Obama negotiated for a profound weakness by underestimating ISIS, getting beaten by Putin in the Ukraine, and, and so forth. But this deal doesn't solve those issues. If we don't get a deal, how long before Iran gets the bomb? Depends on whether you continue the sanctions. It's been pointed out that China and Russia could pu pull out but right now, we have the capacity to really shut down the Iranian economy almost by ourselves through the financial system. We won't have that five or ten years from now. And also, I find it a false question. My feeling is, is that uh, the idea is when do, not when do they get the bomb, whether they ultimately get a bomb. Because what difference does it make whether it's tomorrow or five years from now. An American president will have to deal in an environment where, for example, Iran could evade Iraq or Israel or whatever and have the, the threat of a nuclear weapon. That ultimately was the thing that Putin had in the Ukraine. If we had gone in there, or if the West had gone in there to save the Ukraine, the old issue was do we really want to risk a nuclear war because Putin had the bomb. If Iran has got the bomb, and it's the largest and most powerful economy in the Middle East and has a, a, a land army. Remember, it's 80 million people. This is going to be a very substantial place. We're in a position where we have a theocratic, uh, autocratic type of you know, situation uh, that could be very menacing. And look at the way it's chosen to project power. So, uh, so, all right, so, so, so what are our alternatives? Should, should we go in now and just ground force uh, and and take over Iran now? I mean, what's what's the option? What's so terrible about talking? We haven't agreed to anything. We're talking. Maybe well, we find out there are some, some moderates in there that actually want to actually join the 21st century. 30 seconds, Peter. Well, the thing is, is that we've been shown the outlines of the agreement and continuing to talk uh, serves little purpose if it's to basically reduce those outlines uh, to paper and sign it because it just doesn't go far enough. The question you are asking is a false one. All right, gentlemen, I've only got about 60 seconds left, so I have to get to the really important stuff before we get out of here. Uh, first of all, the final four tonight. Who you like, Peter? Oh, gee whiz. We're a Minnesota <laughs> and a Maryland family, and the folks in Minnesota don't like Wisconsin, and the folks in Maryland don't like Duke. But I guess I have to pick somebody. I like the Badgers. I think there's something else. All right, going to go with the guys that card the upset. What about you, McGraw? I'll go with the Badgers because I'm a Big Ten grad, and Nebraska being the newest member of the Big Ten, I'll have to go with my uh, conference brethren and pick the Badgers. Most of my friends are going with the Badgers simply because they hate Duke. Uh, very quickly, the <laughs> opening of the major... Uh, it's true. Uh, opening of the Major League Baseball season, uh, McGraw, I, I, obviously Cardinals, they beat the Cubs the first day. You realize, of course, you've put entire Chicago into a funk again. You guys did it one single-handed. I will tell you this, the St. Louis Cardinals and the St. Louis Cardinal fans had nothing to do with the fact of giving John Lester $155 million and the man can't throw to first base. <laughs> That's the stat of the year right there. Good hand. And uh, Peter, do I guess for you it's the Orioles? No, it's the Nationals. The Nationals look oh. really good this year. They're going to win their pennant. And maybe this is the year that Washington finally wins a World Series, first time since the 30s. I'm going to talk to you guys later on this year about my Red Sox. McGraw, Millhaven, Peter Morisi, thank thanks so much for joining us, gentlemen. Have a great day. Thanks Do it again time. soon. Bye-bye. All right, take, take care. care. Severe weather ahead for most of the country to see if you need to stock up on supplies. Let's get our Newsmax weather update. This Newsmax TV weather update is brought to you by eVoice. Simple, affordable, better. Taking a look at your weather across the country this morning in the Northwest, Lots of rain from a low pressure system pushing off the west coast. Northern California getting a little rain, but unfortunately, Southern California, very dry. Fresno, even over in a Flagstaff, no rain for you guys. It's all happening in the north and the midwest of the country. Hot in the plains, near 90 there, but look at that Missouri and 
surrounding states getting a lot of thunderstorms, including the uh, southeast is going to get some, some rain. But we've got some warm air pushing up from the Gulf, making South Texas the place to be if you want to hit the beach. Like I said, look at that in the southeast. Tennessee Valley getting lots of thunderstorms and showers there. And even though it's spring, the northeast, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, you guys are still getting some snow. Go out and build a springtime snowman for me. Here's a look at your national weather. All right, let's hope the people out in California get some rain up, but don't ruin the baseball season, all right? By the way, I already got some tweets of people saying, yes, we do hate Duke. When we return, we open the second half of the arena, closing arguments that could very well be life or death for the remaining Boston Marathon bomber. That and so much more as we continue right here on the arena on Midpoint.